Nice to see everyone. And uh, look, I'm Pankaj. Pankaj, so I'm the director of the QBI. And uh, let me start by acknowledging the traditional owners, the Tarabal and the Jagra people, who are the traditional owners of this land where we're meeting today, and their elders, past, present, and those that are emerging. And they have, of course, looked after this land for many, many years. And I think probably did a better job in the older days than we're doing now. Look, welcome to the 2024 Peter Goodnow Memorial Lecture. And uh, welcome to Professor John McGrath and Francis, and you know, our, our speaker for today. And special welcome to our many, many donors and friends and community members who many of you have come to this lecture over the years. And especially Gavin and Karen Bird, who've been uh, old friends of John and supporters of his science for many, many years. Thank you so much, colleagues and friends. Look, uh, let me start by telling you about Peter Goodnow. Mr. Goodnow, who, after whom this annual lecture is named, bequested a significant amount of money to QBI right at this onset of the Institute, really. He uh, gave a significant donation for, for motor neuron disease. An initial donation of about $2 million actually grew to nearly 11 million and has funded quite a few things. Among them is the Goodnow and Wontox Research Laboratory. It's got a dual name to it. It's also funded two scholarships for students from Papua New Guinea, where Peter spent large part of his career, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, and also supports this annual lecture, which has become such a highlight of our annual research calendar. This lecture is given by a prominent speaker who the target actually is to talk about the role of important philanthropy, but generally talk about science that benefits the community, rather than having a very specific neuroscience-based lecture. The first lecture was 2008, and it was given by Gus Nossel, who many of you might have heard of. He was a very prominent immunologist from Melbourne. So the biography of Peter Goodnow was published in 2015, called From Pigs to Penthouses, Life and Times of Peter Goodnow. It's a very short book, and it's a very interesting read. I'm sure you can find it at the UQ library. So Peter was born in 1936 in Cornwall. Uh, and he immigrated to Australia uh, as a 10 pound POM, as they used to be called these days, were very cheap fares to get on the, the sort of uh, ferry. Well, like, they were not exactly ferries, the ships that were bringing people out here. And he ended up in Cairns actually, where he eventually started a civil engineering business, which was a multi-million dollar business that had extensive interests in Papua New Guinea. So one talks, this word one talks is friends in pidgin English, and it refers to uh, Mr. Goodnow's three dogs who were his close friends, and he wanted the laboratories named after him and his dogs, basically, and hence the Peter Goodnow and the one talks laboratory. So his was research was for motor neuron disease, and he in fact passed away from motor neuron disease, which was his main interest in that space. So look, I'm looking forward to John's uh, uh, sort of vision of this space. And John, of course, is uh, many of you know John, he's been part of QBI for a long, long time now and has certainly had kept laboratories in this building since its inception. John is a Brisbane boy, born, grew up in Brisbane and trained in medicine here at the University of Queensland, following which he trained in psychiatry. And after a couple of years in community psychiatry practice, he moved into basic science and has had a strong and illustrious research career. He was for many years director of the Queensland Center for Mental Health Research, which he is now exiting from or in the process of exiting from. And he's had a conjoint professorship at QBI. His main interests really have been in the biology of schizophrenia, the epidemiology development, what actually happens in schizophrenia and looking for treatments for disease, which has been his passion really since the start of his career in science. And he has really forged a very productive cross-disciplinary collaborations uh, across uh, epidemiology, genetics and developmental biology. So he was awarded the John Cade Fellowship by the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council, which is a very prestigious fellowship, and the Niels Bohr Professorship from the Danish National, Danish National Research Foundation, probably the first biologist to receive the Niels Bohr Fellowship. You know, talking to John, you wonder what he has to do with Niels Bohr, but I'm sure in conversation he'll tell you a bit more about uh, the physics that sits behind all of this. He has published over 500 peer-reviewed articles, 32 book chapters, and is one of Australia's most highly cited mental and health researchers. John, look forward to your talk. Welcome.
Thanks very much, Punk. Distinguished guests, friends, colleagues, um, it's a great honour for me to, to join you today. As Punk said, I am in pre-retirement mode. It's actually really hard to do when you love your job. So I've been slowly trying to subtract myself from day-to-day -day responsibilities, but I think I'm failing at that task because I love coming to QBI. Here's a picture of, of Peter Goodenough and these two of his dogs. And, um, and uh, 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 we, we need to acknowledge that uh, there's a very generous gift, but you may not... Punk didn't mention that outside here there is this slit drum. It's a carved out of a, of a tree and there's a slit there and that little dot there is where, he, uh, if you're the chief, you can hit this that dot with a stick uh, and um, that brings good karma and sp the spirits are favourable. Uh, uh, Punkish, I've, I did a review for a, of a centre in Sydney recently and when one of the staff members got a grant at the centre, they had a big bell that they rang. And I'd like to suggest that you should get out or the, or the person who's won the ground and hit this big uh, slit drum because I think we need, it's very hard to, so as, as many of you in the audience know, science is tough. You miss out on grants, your favourite hypotheses don't work, you get papers rejected, you need a very thick skin. And whilst this building's bristling with high technology, it's great that we've got this very spiritual and magic drum outside as well. So I suggest that those of you that want to increase your success at grants uh, should make an offering to the, God, the Wontok gods of grant success. Um, so I'm going to uh, outline a little bit about epidemiology. That's how you count disorders. And I'll tell you a little bit about how to measure the impact or the burden of disorders. Um, and the take-home message is that mental disorders are common and they contribute substantially to the global burden of disease. These are the common calls of, of, of diseases. They affect all of us, you and me, my kids, your kids, everyone. Uh, and, and then uh, we'll get to the focus of the talk, like how can we develop better treatments and prevent illnesses? And this is where we need neuroscience. We, psychiatry needs neuroscience, and in a reciprocal fashion, neuroscience needs psychiatry because we've got the big questions and the really tough questions. And then I'll finish up with a little bit about how we need to invest in research and why that's so important. But I, I want to draw your attention to this artwork. So um, I've been working half-time in a town called Aarhus in, in Denmark. It's in Jutland, the bit of Denmark that sticks off um, uh, Europe. Uh, Copenhagen's on an island called Zealand. And this is the second biggest town. And they had a psychiatric hospital that opened in 1830. And then the hospital closed down and the uh, hospital uh, released photographs of patients from 1873. And that's what you'll be seeing on my slides today. And they, these are uh, completely unidentifiable because they'd, they'd be disconnected from their charts. So we never, don't know their names and never will know their names. Um, and they, the, the pictures were scanned, printed on cloth, and then 30 women artists in Aarhus embroidered these, um, these prints. And they were told to do anything they like, but don't embroider over the face. And what I like about these, th these, uh, this artwork is if you look at the faces, they look just like the faces you'd see on the bus or in this room, maybe of a different ethnic Diversity. Australia is more multicultural, but this is Denmark in 1873. And uh, they look just, if you forget about their clothing, they look just like, this person looks like one of my neighbours. <clears throat> um, so in this building, we, we measure things. We have got lots of really breathtaking microscopes and flow cytometers. We can measure really accurately. But when you're trying to measure the population, you need a different type of instrument. And uh, so for the work I do in epidemiology, the category of observation is everyone in Australia or everyone on the earth. And I'll be showing you some global data shortly. Now, my late father was a plumber. So I can't resist models that are based on hydraulics. <laughs> so here's the beginner's guide to epidemiology. So if the, the water in the tank is like incident cases. Incident means new. So new cases, you remember, you're all epidemiologists now because you've lived through the COVID pandemic. You know about COVID rates and mortality rates, but incidents, the number of new cases, and that's the drip, drip, drip of people developing mental disorders. And then inside the tank or the reservoir or the basin is what you call prevalence. And uh, there's many ways to, 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 to measure that. You could interview people in the community and say, 
have you ever had this disorder in your life? Have you had it in the last 12 months? Have you had the symptoms in the last week? Now, there's two ways to get out of the reservoir. You can recover. Now, that, that happens with many disorders, but it doesn't happen with all the brain disorders we've been talking about. Motor neuron disease and most Alzheimer's, or nearly all Alzheimer's, dementias, there are no cures. Mental disorders, we've got effective treatments and people can recover and go into remission. Um, but that's one way to reduce the prevalence of disorder and mortality is the other. We will not be talking about this topic today, but I've done a lot of work on that as well, uh, premature mortality. Um, and Harvey Whiteford, who gave one of these lectures, and Punk said it was the second Peter Goodenough Memorial Lecture, he and I wrote this paper about epidemiology and we said, if you can't count it, it doesn't count. Because if you've got a battle for the needs of people with brain disorders, you need the numbers to impress upon the health department or treasury and finance. And I'll talk about that uh, more. So this is a picture of beautiful Aarhus. It's the second biggest city. Um, and um, for the Niels Bohr logo, we made the I and the O from Niels Bohr red. So it's a magnifying glass like Sherlock Holmes. Which we tried to use the Niels Bohr professorship, which is about seven or eight million dollars we built a team, 12 people in Aarhus and Copenhagen. We bought a really expensive tandem mass spectroscopy system to measure vitamin D. I won't go into that today, but it's a beautiful city. This is uh, the, um, uh, the modern art gallery. We think of ourselves as Copenhagen's hipster younger brother. It's a quite a lovely place, great restaurants. Um, the reason why I go to Denmark is because they have registers and everyone in Denmark gets a number that they carry with them through their whole life from cradle to grave. And the, the Danes, there's only about five or six million of them, are very open to having that information linked across health and economic measures and be used by researchers when the data is confidential and, and approved. So it's a great privilege to access these data because everyone in Denmark, from prince to pauper, everyone in the kingdom of Denmark is in the, are, are in these registers. So we could, we could do, do this type of research that we need for epidemiology. The problem about these registers is they don't count everyone, but not everyone that has a mental disorder seeks help. And that's where we need surveys. And I'll talk a little bit about, I'll show you data from surveys done around the world. <clears throat> One of the ways that we've, the revolution that happened in the last 20, 30 years relates to how we measure the burden of diseases. And I'll just walk you through this. Some of you may have heard of the Global Burden of Disease, or GBD for short, but if not, this is big, this is big time. This is, these are the biggest studies done on epidemiology. They're highly influential to how governments distribute funding in health and the World Bank and the IMF and all these issues. <clears throat> what it does, you can count diseases that kill you, but also you can count diseases that don't kill you but that disable you, and that's the trick. We're able to put these two things on the same ruler and count them. And uh, the way they did that, it's easy to count uh, the impact of premature death. So if you die at 50 and you expect to live it to 80, uh, then that you've lost 30 years of life. But if you've had a, a, a mild illness that lasted for a week and a moderate illness that disabled you for two months, how can you add up all these non-lethal, non-fatal components of disability? And um, so you could... Um, twist your ankle, have a moon boot on, and be handicapped for four weeks. You can't drive, you've got to put your foot up, you're in mild pain, but you may still be able to work from home. If you've got a, a, a mental disorder, like say depression, comes on in, in uh, late um, teenage years often, and you, you can recover or have persistent mild disorder, it could last for a long time. And I want you to make a mental note of this, that mental disorders can last for a long time. Many people recover, some people uh, recover quickly, and some people have a remittent, remittance and uh, recovery. And what you can do in a, in, a, in a nutshell is that you can add these up. I won't go into other details. <clears throat> now, here's what's happening for the planet Earth for the burden of all diseases. So I'm not talking about mental health. This is all diseases. So in 1990, they have they ranked orders. They, ra they ranked the, the disorders that caused most disability across the planet for 1990. And just look at the top ones, respiratory infection and TB. 
maternal and neonatal uh, child, uh, um, uh, childbirth and, uh, and neonatal deaths. Um, enteric infections, these are the kids that were di uh, di diarrhea, it's so easy to treat now with proper uh, fluid replacement. Other infections, here's malaria and nutritional de deficits. So in 1990, some of the top causes of disability were nutrition and infection. And now let's go to four or five years ago. <clears throat> and the whole profile of diseases on the planet Earth have evolved. So now, top of the pops. I, I'm just going to go back because I forgot to show you. There's mental disorders, 13 out of 20 on this beauty, beauty contest. And here's the most, some recent data. And mental disorders is now number two. Musculoskeletal back aches, uh, aches and pains are higher. Neurological disorders are there. And then infection and nutritional disorders are sliding down because we are getting better at treating those disorders. We clean water, mosquito nets, vaccinations, all the things that can then reduce the burden of infectious and nutritional disorders. And it's working. It has worked. And look at what we've done as a, as a global community. But th the issue is now that, that his neurological disorders gone up considerably. And when I teach students, this is the metaphor I use. So as the tide of nutritional and infectious diseases goes out, the rocks of mental disorders and brain diseases are laid bare. That's what's happening. So the kids that would die of some type of gastro infection are now living and getting mental disorders or dementia. So there's a whole range of uh, epidemiological transition things that are happening. Um, this uh, says King for a day, and uh, the artist that did this one put a crown on this young uh, this, this gentleman with the impressive uh, sideburns and gave him a crown as well. Uh, now I'm going to surveys, and uh, I work with an uh, international consortium of people who are based at Harvard, and they've all used the same type of instrument to assess mental disorders. Remember, we were showing microscopes or burden of disease measures. So we can interview people and then get an idea of, um, the, of uh, what type of disorders they had. And I'll just walk you through how surveys operate. So if you want to do one in Australia, you decide you'll do so much in urban regions or peri-urban regions and some rural and remote regions. And that once you've distributed that in a fair way, then you do a map and you enumerate and map where every house is. And then you randomly select houses and you knock on the door and say, how many adults live here? And if they say four, you randomly pick one and you say, would you mind doing an interview with me about your mental health and well-being?" And then you sit down and do a very careful interview. It takes four or five hours sometimes, depending on what the symptoms are. And all these people have done the same type of surveys in many nations. And this paper we just published last year, but the surveys weren't, weren't all done last year, they were done over 20 years. So we had 32 surveys in 29 nations and we interviewed 150,000 people. This is the biggest data set for looking at the lifetime prevalence of mental disorders and the age of onset. And it doesn't have every mental disorder. You'll see anxiety disorders, panic, PTSD, generalized anxiety disorder, social phobia, mood disorders, major depression. One in four Australians get a major depression at some time during their life. These are very common. But bipolar disorder, substance misuse, everyone knows someone that's had problems with alcohol. Okay, this is it's the wallpaper of our life, that these mood disorders, substance use, anxiety disorders are common. And they had ADHD. They did not have schizophrenia. And they didn't have autism, unfortunately. But I'll be showing you data based on these 13 types of mental disorders. And there's a long, long list of countries, Nigeria, South America, Lebanon, and they included the refugees in Lebanon, and Poland, rich countries as well, Australia, uh, New Zealand. And here's the first take home message. I want you to wake up and absorb this. I'll, I'll give you a quiz at the end of this talk, <laughs> okay? So if you live to 75, what is your chance of getting one of those mental disorders? It's about 50%. So for males, it was 46%, just under 50. And for females, it was just over 50. So these are the disorders that affect everyone. This is all of us. They're very, very common disorders. And this doesn't include schizophrenia or autism, um, 
But this is why mental disorders are kicking up on those rankings of burden of disease. Now, I'm going to ask you to think, I'm going to give you a question. Across the lifespan from, say, 5 to 75, I want you to think about what's the riskiest period of your life to develop a mental disorder for the first time. Is it 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40? I won't ask you to put your hands up. I just want you to think, based on your knowledge, when do people, when are they most likely to develop a mental disorder for the first time? That's incidence. That's the drip, drip, drip of new cases. And here's the answer. This is the only data slide I'm going to show you today. I'm going to ask your forbearance. forbearance. I'm going to walk you through what this slide shows. On the x-axis, we have age, 5 to 10, 15, right up to 75. And on the, this uh, left-hand uh, vertical axis, we've got incidence. That's the drip in tap. This is the new cases. And look, it's 15. Now, mental health professionals know this. Your biggest risk of developing a mental disorder for these 15, 13 types is between 10 and 20. These are teenagers, okay? Um, and politicians need to, need to hear this. We're used to talking about cancer, dementia, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, uh, et cetera. But these are things that come on in the, in the fifth, sixth, and seventh decade of life. This is coming on in the second decade of life. Um, and then this other uh, arrow goes to the other uh, vertical axis, and this adds up across the lifespan, what's your total risk, projected risk? And this is the 50% that I showed you before, females slightly higher than males. We were able to ask a, a question for the first time. We said, within the subset of people, one and one two of us, who develop a mental disorder by age 75, What's the median age that they're going to develop it? And guess what? It's 20. Okay. That's that little red dot there, 20 and 19. So again, half of those that develop a mental disorder are going to get it when they're teenagers or um, very young anyway. And um, I don't need to remind this audience that this is an age range that's very important for educational attainment your, your transition, uh, intimate relationships, differentiating from your family of origin, um, uh, joining the workforce, all these things pile in on young people. And if you get a mental disorder uh, at this age, you can be quite disabled for many decades. And that's why we're showing up um, in, the, uh, in that burden of disorder. And I'll show you a little bit more about that shortly. Um, this gentleman as a fob watch, which he's proudly displaying here. And I, I really like the way the artist is sketched in this ghost. I think the man was very proud of his fob watch, I'm kind of thinking maybe he's Tempest Fugit or Time Flies. But he's looking very intently at us from 1873. I don't know what type of mental disorder he had. He seems to be well-dressed. How can we reduce the burden of mental disorders? Well, let's go back to our hydraulics metaphor. You can turn off the tap, and that's primary prevention, and that works really well with vaccinations. Or putting the price of tobacco up has reduced the incidence of smoking, lung cancer is going down. Ian Fraser developed that vaccine, HPV vaccine, and stopped many women getting cancer. Uh, exercise is important, good diets, all these things are really important for your brain and for your body as well. And, and in the work that, that my colleagues and I have been doing on vitamin D, we're actually trying to get in and prevent people getting the disorder in the first place. So you can reduce the burden, what the number, the amount of people in the, in, the, in the reservoir by turning off the tap, or you can make better treatments. And we're also trying to do that at the Queensland Centre for Mental Health Research, and you're doing it here in this building. And I'll give you some examples shortly. We need treatments that work faster, that are more effective and persistent and with no side effects. I'm just going to dwell on this point a little bit because there's a little, there's kind of this, um, what's the word, um, this, this faint stigma of low expectations in, in mental health where you just don't expect everyone to get better. And I don't think we should accept that. So what, what is the ideal outcome 
for, for mental disorders and brain disorders. It must be this. It must be everyone recovers immediately and has a sustained recovery and with no side effects. Let's go through that again. Everyone, not just 20%. Immediate treatment. You can reduce the, the duration of disability. Uh, persistent, so they stay well and have, don't have side effects. And we're nowhere near that. We're nowhere near that for mental disorders, for dementia, motor neurone disease. Progress is being made, but we, that we have a long way to go. And I'll come back to this about it will happen. This will happen. We are making progress. But I want to um, impress upon you now that um, with respect to mental health, providing more services is not enough. This would be the same for many mental disorders. I want you to think of a big pie chart or a big pizza of all the burden to do with mental disorders and how much can we avert or, tr or get rid of by current treatments. It's a pretty thin slice of the pizza. What about if we told everyone to just use treatments that work and we got better at using effective treatments? You, you get a little bit more bang for your buck. What about if you invest, if the health department puts money into the best, most effective treatments, puts a bit more money in, then you can actually avert more. And this is happening in Australia with Headspace and a whole range of um, you know, new, new interventions to help young people. And the, this green slice of the pizza is what I call the magic, uh, magic lamp or the GD phase, because this, this goes like this. What if you had unlimited money and there was a psychiatrist and psychologist and a counsellor on every corner everyone could get access to the current treatments immediately, how much would you revert? Not much more. That's that, that's that little slice of the pizza there. So what's the rest? This is the burden of mental disorders that we cannot avert. So this is very sobering news. If this was a pie chart for dementia, it would all be yellow, basically, or motor neurone disease. Um, and what's the solution? We need to do more research. And that's what, why we have these lectures. I'm obviously preaching to the converted. But we need to, investing in better care is not enough. We need to invest in research. And the next part of my talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about how can we speed up discoveries. And um, I'm a huge fan of Galileo. Anyone been to the Galileo Museum in here? <laughs> so it's in Florence. Skip the queues at the Uffizi. It's just behind the Uffizi, and it's a great museum. It's a little museum, and it's got these telescopes from Galileo. They're actually the ones he used. And I was really shaken. I only discovered this quote a few years ago because we have a schizophrenia conference in Florence. And it's a brilliant statement. This is Galileo's advice, how to do research, and it is so concise, you've got to say it twice for it to sink in. This is what he said, how to do science. Measure. What is measurable, make measurable what is not so. What's he saying? He's saying that if you've got a telescope, you, you use that to measure something. And if you can't measure what you want to measure, make something that can, can do that. And uh, this is a, a profound statement. Um, I bought the T-shirt and the fridge magnets. I've got this fridge magnet. So Galileo, he didn't invent the telescope, but he got the lenses from somewhere in the Netherlands and uh, made a telescope. And he pointed it at the moon and he saw what he thought were lakes. And he, this is a watercolour that he did. And then he wanted to do more. He wanted to look at the other objects, the moving stars, the planets. So he got a bigger telescope and he saw the rings of Saturn. He didn't know there were rings. He just thought, that's weird. This one's not a strange shape. And then, oops, then he got the biggest telescope and pointed it at Jupiter. And he saw the moons growing around Jupiter. And then he realised with a lot of other evidence as well, that the Earth wasn't at the centre of the solar system. The sun was at the centre of the solar system and the Earth rotated around the sun. And he, he published that and was promptly excommunicated by the Pope. <laughs> so the other thing in this, um, in, this, uh, in this museum, somehow or another, someone chopped off his middle finger and they preserved it under a glass dome. So there's this shriveled ugly looking finger, and it's there pointing at the Pope. I was right. And subsequent Popes have actually retracted and recanted and, and now he's been brought back into the church. Uh, but this is an example of where measure what is measurable, make measurable what is not so. And this is the brilliant Spanish neuroscientist, Santiago Ramon y Carjal. 
And uh, he used a stain that came from a, an Italian researcher that was a freakish discovery. Of course, it, when you put it on the brain, it didn't, it didn't blot all, it didn't stain all cells. It just was picked up by me, some cells and it seemed to fill the cells. And when uh, Cajal was doing this work, we didn't know whether the brain was one grey goo like sort of uh, jelly or it was made up of lots of little cells. And so Cajal used this stain sat down with his microscope and did these fantastic drawings. And look, there's a whole universe of beautiful things down here. There's a cell body, there are processes, there are fibre tracks. Stunning. And he got the Nobel Prize for this. And it was the foundation of modern neuroscience. And it really only happened, you know, in, um, one or two generations ago. But that's where a telescope was made, uh, and uh, in this case a microscope and a stain, and he was able to measure things. And that's what we're trying to do in this building. Um, the trouble with mental disorders is that they've been affected by stigma. And, you know, this is a, we wasted a lot of time in, in, in psychiatry with misunderstandings and, you know, psychosis, the horror, split personalities, nothing to do with schizophrenia, dangerous. Well, people with schizophrenia are more likely to be victims of violence rather than perpetrators. And if they do occasionally commit violence, it's usually because they've, slip through treatment. Bad parents, that is completely wrong. But we all remember that, uh, that in the 50s and 60s of last century, parents were blamed for mental disorders like schizophrenia. Untreatable, that's not true. We have reasonable treatments for some symptoms now. And this is a statement which resonates. It uh, says, to have forgotten that schizophrenia is a brain disease will go down as one of the great errors, greatest errors of 20th century medicine. We lost a lot of time, and now we've got a lot of catching up to do. So schizophrenia uh, is a poorly understood group of brain disorders, and you need to think of it like fever. We used to think fever was one disease, and then we realised it was this infection and there was um, uh, autoimmune disorders and a whole range of other uh, factors that could cause fever. And we really don't know how many types of disorders underpin schizophrenia, probably hundreds or thousands. It impacts on cognition, perception, and feeling, about one in 100. So it's not common like depression. This is a rarer disorder, more common in boys. Uh, about a third get well, a third have a on and off picture, and a third have a persistent illness. It's found in all cultures. And it impacts on delusions, have false beliefs, hallucinations, et cetera, and other uh, aspects which I won't go into. But one of the, 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 the really important things that you see with other brain disorders like dementia is that sometimes the individual doesn't have doesn't realise they're sick, and this is upsetting for family and caregivers, because you need your brain to know something's wrong with me. If you kick your toe, you know that I need to walk carefully on the toe. But if you've got a broken brain, it, it stops you reflecting on on your lot. And one of the big discoveries in the last three four decades is that schizophrenia probably, at least in part, is a disorder of early brain development. Uh, so sometime before the child's born, something goes slightly wrong. It's a complex, poorly understood mix of genetic and non-genetic factors, but it just derails the development. So this young man who might end up at Princess Alexandra Hospital one night hearing voices, he didn't get sick that day. Something went wrong earlier on. Not for everyone, but this is this is a very potent theory. Um, and to, if you want to understand this neurodevelopmental disorder, you need to understand how to build a healthy brain. And first off, where are the instructions? Well, genetics is really, really important. This is a really stunning photograph of four generations of women, and you can see they look alike. And mental disorders are just like every other disorder. They tend to run in families. That's not so unusual whether it be asthma, breast cancer, diabetes, height, uh, and things like depression, anxiety, schizophrenia can run in families as well. But there's been a huge um, uh, tsunami of information in the last 20 years coming thick and fast, and we now understand a lot more about the genetics of schizophrenia in particular and mental disorders in general. And there were some, some surprises. We were kind of hoping... In, that there might be one big gene that would unravel a pathway and we could target it with a pill. Um, it's not that. It's something much more interesting. 
there's hundreds or thousands of tiny variants that we all carry that increase your risk of getting something like schizophrenia. So I might have 150 of these variants, someone else might have 152, and we all of us have a slightly, each of us has a slightly different risk of getting a disorder like schizophrenia. And this is people like Brian Mowry and uh, Naomi Ray and David Evans is here. There's a lot of really excellent genetics research uh, happening at UQ that, are, that is unravelling in a day-to-day -day basis the genetics of common disorders and mental disorders in particular. It's not just your genes, clearly. No one thinks that for a microsecond. Um, but obviously, if you want to build a healthy brain, you need good nutrition and a loving, caring environment. The brain is an expectant organ, is, is experience is expectant. You might not have heard that word before, but let me unpack it. The brain expects input. So it's waiting to hear from the mother and the family. And it's ready. They're the, some of the really important instructions to build a healthy brain. And it pulls in this information from the environment. Some of you have seen this slide many times. But I've often said, you know, we put a man on the moon over 50 years ago. Why haven't we been able to prevent schizophrenia? And the answer is that brain disorders are much, much harder than putting a man on the moon. That's a walk in the park. Understanding the way the brain works is much, much more complicated. So we know about the parts in the brain, but, but the parts aren't always the same and we don't know how they all go together. Um, but I'm going to spend a few minutes now talking about how we as, as the community, and particularly the research community, can optimise discovery. So this is research on how to do research, okay? It's meta-research. And this is, there is a science here, okay? So... Um, how to optimise biomedical discovery. You want to build a team that questions dogma, okay? You want people that will challenge your thinking in a respectful way for old, oldies like us. We don't want <laughs> to be insulted by the junior people, but you need someone who will tug the prophet's beard. And so question dogma because that, this type of um, attitude of, uh, of worldview is essential for research. You don't want to fall in love with your hypotheses. For every correct hypothesis, hypothesis, there's an infinite number of wrong ones. Most hypotheses are wrong. So we need people in the team that challenge the dogma. And then this is a really important one that I, I remind junior researchers. Um, you must treasure your failures. You must fondle them and respect them. Because if you listen to the failures, they will provide you with great insight. And Punk was talking about Niels Bohr. The physicist, um, he had a very pithy statement. He said, no paradox, no progress. It's only when you see something, that's funny. Like, I had this theory that the world would operate on Newtonian principles, and I'm getting down to the atom. That's what Niels Bohr did. He had the little solar system model of the atom. And then things didn't operate like Newton, and that's quantum theory. So, so you th reject your own hypothesis, and you examine failures and you don't try to ignore them or walk away from them, they teach you really important things. And, um, you know, doing research is like setting up you know, cricket stumps and then you've got to try to bowl them down. And the metaphor that I use for students is, is that um, building hypotheses is like building sandcastles on the beach. It's great fun. You build your hypothesis, you fall in love with it, you make a great sandcastle. And then at the end, when you time to go home, you can kick the sandcastle down, which is great fun. It's really horrible if someone else kicks your sandcastle down. <laughs> so the moral of the story is if you come up with a hypothesis, you be the one that rejects it. You enjoy that, that process. You wear it as a badge of courage. Oh, I reject it. And I've done many trials. There are rejected hypotheses. So this is the importance of examining failure. And the last secret source about how to optimise discovery is to engage outsiders. Now, you might think that's bleeding obvious, John. You know, if you want someone who knows about Drosophila or you need someone who understands about scanning electron microscopy, you bring that expert in. Sure, that's what we do a lot of that here. We've got many people working on many different organisms with many different uh, tools and microscopes, et cetera. But that's actually not the secret source. The secret source is when you talk to people outside your field, you can't use jargon. You have to simplify your statements. And that can sometimes break up the cobwebs of, 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 uh, of, of uh, stuck ideas. They talk to people 
uh, argue with people. Gal and I argue all the time, don't we? In a friendly way. <laughs> <laughs> it's, no, it's, not, it's not a personal thing. It's not an ego thing. It's, we, we argue about the data. And Francis Crick, the co-discoverer, or one of the several people who discovered the structure of DNA, said your best friend in science is someone who will argue with you. And I think that's right. But it's not an attack. It's just like, you're wrong, John. <laughs> like Daryl. No, you're always wrong, Daryl. <laughs> so that's, that's, and if you get those things together, then you're more likely, it's not a 100% um, certainty, but you're more likely to make those discoveries. So what we do is we set traps for discovery. And that's the, the function of QBI. We're a big engine to trap ideas. And um, one of the things that I've done is I've come from epidemiology and Dal and I have been looking, and Tom, who's here as well, we've been looking at uh, vitamin D. And that came from epidemiology. We had this strange thing about season of birth and then animal models. I'll come back to that in a second. Brain imaging, fantastic discoveries about schizophrenia and dopamine. And this is also part of that uh, virtuous cycle to optimise discovery. And um, I really want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the people. Tom, this is you with, before you had your beard. <laughs> Daryl, James Kesby, Jaing, Pauline, and Susie. Many of you are in the audience now. I want to thank you. So Daryl and this team, Tom and Daryl, I think they've had about a dozen NHMRC project grants. I don't count them anymore. And over 10, 15 years, the people in this building show that if you take out vitamin D in a developing rodent, you change a lot of things about the brain. So I'm not going to go into details, but this is what I call translational epidemiology. We've got a clue from epidemiology, maybe vitamin D is a candidate, and then you come to a neuroscience institute and you do the, the hard work. You roll your sleeves up. It's not going to happen overnight. It's almost 20 years to develop a new animal model. And I'm really proud of this paper which we published many years ago, 2011, and Big Ideas for Small Brains. Uh, are you an author on this one, Massimo? <laughs> so, so I loved working with people. This is a, a, a C. elegans, a little tiny worm. This is a fish, this is a bee, and that's a fly. And, uh, and I just so, you get research envy, like everyone else's research seems more interesting than yours. But I was just mesmerized by how brilliant it is for these tiny brains. You can actually ask questions and sometimes get at the molecular level. And you've all probably seen this quote, that if the human brain was so simple that we can understand it, we would be so simple that we couldn't. Well, these are simple, tiny little brains and people in this room have been working really hard for decades and we still don't fully understand, um, you know, Barry's here. You've got the a fellow, the FRS, Miss Barry, yeah, for looking at uh, mating behaviour in the fly and you kind of think, what's that got to do with schizophrenia? Actually, it's a really important pathway to discovery because you can look at uh, innate behaviours that may be really important for one species, not so important, but Mother Nature sometimes recycles things. Um, and uh, here's you, Massimo. Um, and uh, it's one of our senior faculty, and he looks at a tiny worm, and I think there's only about 300 neurons in this little critter. It's smaller than a full stop on a page. Compared to this, the human brain, 86 billion. <laughs> but Massimo, by laser dissecting this, um, the, 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 the process from the neuron, was able to look at the molecular mechanisms, how that neuron healed itself. And he was on the cover of Nature. And you know this guy here. <laughs> and King Wally here. So on level five, uh, um, Hunkish and his team have been looking at learning and memory, how memory is laid down and, and updated. And that's led to, we know, well, they know an awful lot about this part of the brain, the pathways, the mechanisms. It relates to anxiety and the treatment of anxiety as well. And that's led directly to Punkish's ongoing work on deep brain stimulation and Parkinson's disease. And this is what happens in a place like QBI. My good friend, Daryl, actually discovered how to measure vitamin D in neonatal blood spots, which was a really important breakthrough for us. And he took three years, mate, didn't it? We nearly gave up at one stage. That was that he was making that telescope like Galileo. But now he's trying to get clozapine into the brain in a, a more efficient way. This is changing, increasing the number of people who are recovering and without side effects. And he's trying to put clozapine in nasal sprays and uh, been funded to do that. 
Jürgen Gotz and Peter Nestor, two senior faculty here, and they're using ultrasound um, to shake up the, the brain, blood-brain barrier. And this seems to be on its own to be effective for some uh, disorders, but it will also help get products of interest or treatments into the brain. So I'm just going to wind up now. So um, what's the secret source of doing research? Well, you just need to get on with it and um, bring people together, have question dogma. And this is a, a great little slogan, slogan about happy accidents. Um, when scientists find things they were not looking for, and you need to be alert for those uh, fantastic events. And I've got these, this picture of my good friend Karen and, and uh, Gavin Bird in the front row here. And it's a real privilege to know people that have been really important for schizophrenia research in, in Brisbane, uh, friends and also donors to QBI, um, because this is absolutely essential for us to make progress. Um, and Mary Lasker, an American philanthropist, she said, if you think research is expensive, try disease. And that's a pretty pithy statement. Disease is much more expensive. And my second and last slide is, is here, here are all the patients now. They're in three panels. And uh, so I asked before, um, will we be able to treat schizophrenia and prevent schizophrenia? And, and we spread that out to, will we be able to reduce the incidence of mental disorders? And will we be able to treat people with mental disorders in a more efficient way? And I'm 100% confident we will. We owe it to the people here from 1873. We owe it to the people, who, our friends and family who are living with mental disorders now. And we owe it to future generations. And it will happen and we can do it. And I want to finish there and acknowledge uh, Queensland Centre for Mental Health Research. It's a great place to work. I'll, I'll miss it greatly. UQ, QBI, and my Danish university, and my Danish funding agencies. Thanks very much. Thanks, John, for an incredible journey and some amazing insights and uh, a visual, a sort of view into how research operates and how to get better at it. So, look, we have plenty of time for questions. I think there's a roving microphone somewhere. So uh, feel free to ask John anything, even tell him he's wrong. So I'm sure he's wrong about a number of things. Thanks, John. Great talk. I was wondering if the... The, uh, the slide you showed where the incidence of mental illness is within the, the early years, within the 20 years, is that a change or did you see a progression with the modern time versus 15, 20, 30 years ago or is something that is always stays the same? Yes, good question. We published the paper in Lancet Psychiatry and we did that for the reviewers. We spliced it up into decades, but the data gets a bit thin. Uh, we did not find massive changes, but th the answer to your question from other data sources is absolutely r the risk of mental disorder changes. It went, anxiety and depression went up during COVID and in, in a particular way that might surprise you as well. When we had lockdown, and I'm talking about the planet Earth, not just Brisbane, when we had lockdown, uh, depression went up and that was judged by Google Analytics about how many how many people were moving around. Um, so you could tell when a, a lockdown happened by Google Analytics. And then uh, anxiety went up when the death rate went up. So And young people were getting anxiety and depression. And lockdown was particularly disruptive for young people. War, civil distress, d d d distress um, tsunamis, uh, they all change the rates of mental disorder. But going back to your question, there is evidence that mental disorders are becoming more common in young people, and that's a worry. Thank you. Well, mm -hmm. Sorry. No. Thank you, John. Lovely talk. Um, I was wondering, again, about this study. Did you look at specific, uh, like country-specific risk factors for age of onset? Uh, or even if it wasn't country level, like maybe region level, or mm -hmm. did you find any risk factors associated with the age of onset? Not in that study, because that wasn't the focus of the paper. It was a very big paper to just get all those 32 surveys together in a harmonised way. But other people have done that. And there's a whole range of risk factors that do, do bring forward the age of onset and the absolute risk of getting uh, in there. Things like childhood sexual abuse, early cannabis use, trauma, exposure to trauma, um, uh, 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 early um, 
uh, other drugs as well can impact on risks of mental disorders. It's civil dis disruption, as I was saying to Massimo a few minutes ago. There's a range of cultural and social factors that impact on the risks of mental disorders. Mental disorder epidemiology is not like the planked constant of, of the universe. It goes up and down constantly. And, uh, and it makes sense. I it? meant more in terms of when the age of onset would start. So, because I'm just thinking, if you have people who develop a mental disorder later, mm -hmm. is it possible that there were some, actually maybe protective factors that stopped them from developing that disorder earlier and then developed it right later? Yeah, but that's, yes, I, that, that, that question is, um, what, what are the factors that influence how old you are when you get the disorder? Yeah. So, in, yes. in, for example, in depression, uh, it, uh, rates can go up um, after menopause in women. Schizophrenia has a little blip, uh, in slight bump, when women go through menopause as well. So there's something about estrogen. And remember, this is as a group of disorders that is more common in men than in women. So uh, there, are, there are clues that if you have a prominent family history, you may tend to have an earlier age of onset compared to people that don't have an affected family member. But that's not so simple because most of us that develop mental disorders do not have an affected first degree for reasons that I can't go into. Uh, but um, there are a range of uh, risk factors. So you may develop your first onset Set of a disorder because you've been exposed to a great trauma, a bereavement, a COVID epidemic, head injury, whatever. And there's a lot of the things we don't really understand yet about those causes, life events, divorce, etc. They all contribute to pushing people who are at risk of mental disorders from developing them. Thank you. John, I I love the quote from Mary Lasker there. It's very nice. Yeah. Um, as somebody who likes to count things and measure things, can you put some numbers on that? I mean, all the economists have put numbers on that. How much, what is the global cost of, of these diseases versus the amount that's spent on medical research? Yes. Yeah, so so um, that, those type of studies have been done in Australia. In fact, Harvey Whiteford, who, who's a colleague, many of us in the room are from the Queensland Centre for Mental Health Research. Harvey um, was a commissioner on the, uh, for the Productivity Commission. And they looked at that. And uh, I, I can't give you a figure, but each disease uh, can impact on a huge amount of lost work. So uh, we published papers, I've done a systematic review on the costs of mental disorders, and some of them are very, very expensive. If you need inpatient care, that goes up enormously. But Barry, if, if we include things like lost productivity, like the person's not going to work because they've got depression or they've got alcohol abuse, they're not going to work, then you, that costs our society a huge amount. And as well, there are, the, there's a thing called presenteeism where you go to work, but you're not fully alert and that de depletes the wealth. So we talk about the mental wealth of the nation. And um, I can't give you a figure. Uh, sometimes disease groups will, um, lobby groups will give you a figure and they're usually grossly inflated. You pay access economics and they'll tell you that disease X is the most expensive disorder. Um, but it's, it's not that simple. And then you, you've also got to count the, co the, the costs of caregiving. So if you've got a child with a mental disorder or a parent with a mental disorder and you can't go to work, then that's impacting on our society. So if you add it all up, then it is a very emotionally and financially expensive thing for a nation. And uh, it, it has been quantified. If you look up the Productivity Commission, you'll see all the costings there. Sort of orders of magnitude? Is it like 1%, 0.1%? Uh, 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 no, I actually don't have those figures at the top of my head. Harvey would. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big number. <laughs> so, John, I want to talk to you about something you know a little bit about, but probably not the absolute person to talk about. I want to talk about interventions. A lot of people in the audience outside that come to QBI, not just mm -hmm. the scientists, and the scientists are probably aware of the advent of the Headspace program mm -hmm. that Pat uh, got up in yes, Australia. Yes. It's been going for quite a while now. So my questions are twofold. The, the Headspace initiative, mm -hmm. which that costs money, and it, we thought, I thought greedily mm -hmm. that this would be a way I'd actually get access to, to prodromal patients, but that never panned out. But, but it's, it's, an, it's a, an early intervention program, an early assessment program, mm -hmm. and I think it's very important that the work be done to see what impact has it had because we sort of lead the world in this and other countries could adopt this too if it's having any effect. Have you got any feeling for that, John? Yeah, there have been reviews of Headspace. 
and uh, um, there's very good patient satisfaction. There's sometimes quite high dropout, and some people don't get the, the right dose of treatment. Um, there are other headspaces or similar services around the world, and they tend to be very good at people that have transient um, types of mental disorders like adjustment disorder and who have a good recovery rate. And that's fine. They, these people still need care. Um, uh, and uh, But... Um, uh, but Headspace only goes through early 20s, 25, and a lot of us get our first mental illness after that age. That cumulative incidence curve, still a lot of people get in their first mental disorder after age 20, half of us. But that was based on, you know, that data you had there, that's, it's, it's entirely set yeah. up to try and have a go at yeah, that. Yeah, you look, I, I, I don't criticise Pat and... Uh, not, yeah. not, I'm not meaning what, to that. What, what, we need, the okay, the, the, what we're trying to do is grow the pie. This okay. is us disagreeing, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got to grow the pie. And when you've got a next Australian of the Year, like Pat and Ian Hickey as well, then they can get through the politicians to invest. Now, it's not perfect, and they would say that as well, but it's, 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 it's not as bad as it used to be. We can't go backwards... We're still not, you know that pie that I showed you, the avertible pie? It, we, it, even if you put like, huh, if you had a headspace on every corner, it still have that big chunk of yellow pie, okay? And that's why we need research. We need better treatments and we need prevention. I think we're probably done with questions. So look, thank you everyone, everyone. And join me in thanking, thanking John for a wonderful lecture. And uh, join us outside on the deck for some nibbles, some drinks.